when we're practicing lawyers, especially those doing litigation, it's pretty common that someone will hire you to represent someone else, like a family member, an employee, maybe an insurance company has hired you to represent one of their policyholders. And so one party is paying the lawyer's fees, their legal fees, and probably the costs of the litigation in order to provide representation to someone else as the client. Now, this comes up twice in the model rules. First in rule 1.7 in the ABA's comments to the rule, because this can pose a material limitation on the lawyer's judgment in providing the representation. But it also comes up as a standalone rule in 1.8 F, and that's what we're going to talk about here. In 1.8 F, the ABA sets forth three bright line requirements for lawyers in this situation. And so even though this overlaps quite a bit with 1.7, and frankly, if you violate this rule, you've probably violated 1.7 as well, but this rule is clearer. I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my professional responsibility class. Let's dive in. Well, 1.8 F begins, a lawyer shall not accept compensation for representing a client from one other than the client unless, and then there's three conditions that have to be met. First, the client gives informed consent. So the client has to know what's going on, know who's paying the lawyer, and has to agree to this situation. Two, there can be no interference with the lawyer's independent professional judgment or with the client-lawyer relationship. In other words, the person paying can't start telling the lawyer how to handle the case. And third, information relating to the representation of a client is protected by Rule 1.6, which is our confidentiality rule. In other words, just because someone is paying you to represent someone else doesn't mean that they're entitled to know everything about the representation unless the client that you're representing agrees to you making those disclosures. Now, just a quick word about how to spell the word payer. Um, either spelling payer with an E-R or with an O-R, like payor, is correct. And the latter is a little more common in legal writing, but the ADA spells it P-A-Y-E-R in the comment to this rule. Now, note that this issue with the third-party payer also came up in the comments to Rule 1.7. Now, comment 14 to 1.8 um, sort of fleshes out this rule a little bit, and it says that there's a few situations that are very common. I, I actually have them listed, I think, in order of how common they are. First, insurance defense, right? So you have someone who um, has uh, filed a claim maybe to have their medical bills paid and an insurance company is wants reimbursement for that or indemnification from the tortfeasor, or more often the tortfeasor has an, a liability insurer that is representing them when they're sued. In other words, you could actually have the insurance companies funding the lawyers on both sides of a personal injury action. Um, Co-clients, very common. Uh, employers, if someone sues um, uh, uh, an employee and the company they work for, because usually the company is a deeper pocket and employees are often judgment proof, but the employee individual was probably the real tortfeasor. Um, so a lot of times a company that's a defendant that's being sued along with one of their managers or employees will basically fund the lawyer for the employee. A labor unions sometimes will provide a lawyer basically or fund the um, legal costs for one of their members. Parents or relatives, especially um, parents of grown children like college age, college students, grad students who get arrested for uh, driving drunk or something like that, the parents will often hire the lawyer. And it could also just be uh, friends or uh, a partner, a life partner, a romantic partner, like a boyfriend or girlfriend. So those are our kind of most common situations. Now, there can be different agendas, and that's where the problem is here. Those paying the lawyer often have their own priorities, and number one is probably going to be minimizing the cost of the amount spent on the representation. So they may say, I don't want to hire experts. I don't want you to hire jury consultants. I don't want to have uh, um, do e-discovery because that can be very expensive. They also often want to be kept abreast or informed about how the representation is progressing. And because of those two main things, 
the client has to give informed consent. So they need to authorize the disclosures and they need to um, authorize the decisions that are made about the, the expenditures and what's happening. And even with the client's consent, there can't be interference. You can't have someone, a, a third party on the side telling the lawyer what to do. Now, in some cases, this is going to be easy. It's sufficient to get the client's informed consent as to the payment and the identity of the third party payer, especially grown children with their parents, as I picture here, usually the, the, the child, the grown, uh, the, let's say the college student has no objection to their parents paying for um, the lawyer and it's no mystery who the parents are. But um, some situations, especially with insurance defense, can get more complicated. And if the fee agreement creates a conflict of interest for the lawyer, then the lawyer is going to have an issue with material limitations under 1.7. Now, the ABA put out a particularly unhelpful ethics opinion back in 1996 about doing insurance defense work. Um, and basically, they gave no guidance about whether a lawyer who's retained by an insurer to represent the policyholder represents only the insured or the insurer as well as a co-client. It's a little unclear. You would need to check the rules in your jurisdiction and also the terms of the agreement that you have with the insurer that hires you. They did say, though, in that um, ethics opinion in the late 90s, that if the insured, that's the policyholder, there's no question that that person's the client, uh, at least one of the clients. Uh, if they object to a settlement that the um, policy would authorize the insurer to make, the lawyer has to give them an opportunity to reject the insurer's defense and assume the defense at their own expense. In other words, you could have a, um, a liability policy that uh, it covers a million dollars in liability, let's say. And so the insurance company wants to settle within the policy limits. It's very important because they haven't been paid for uh, to cover more than that uh, in theory. And so if there's a settlement offer, let's say for half of that amount, the insurance company might be inclined to take it, but the client might be indignant because they want to be vindicated that they didn't do anything wrong. If that happens and the client is, you reach an impasse, you have a problem, right? Because the payer doesn't want to keep going with the litigation. Well, at that point, you at least have to give the client a chance to continue paying you out of their own pocket with the representation. I don't want to get too far afield into this because it deals with the terms of insurance agreements, but that's what you need to know for purposes of my test or the MPRE. So let's continue. In criminal cases, um, Third-party payment of a defendant's legal fees can raise due process and Sixth Amendment concerns. So sometimes if you have people, uh, two defendants that are tried together because uh, charged together because they're accomplices to a crime or co-conspirators, one of them might be paying for the lawyer for um, two or more of the defendants. And if the trial court is aware that one defendant is basically paying for the lawyer for the group, and or that they there you have a criminal defendant who is whose lawyer is being paid by someone else the judge has a duty then an obligation to inquire further to protect the defendant's rights to make sure that the defendant is going to get a fair trial why because in criminal justice cases we're really concerned about the stakes right the person could lose their liberty for years at a time if they're incarcerated or if it's a death penalty case um, could pay the ultimate price and so we want to make sure that their lawyer isn't being influenced by a third party payer. Here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. Let's say a college student is arrested for uh, driving while intoxicated and his parents hire a lawyer for him. The parents tell the lawyer not to accept any plea bargain that involves jail time. Should the lawyer just follow whatever instruction the parents give if they're paying his fees, regardless of what the, um, the client says? Yes or no? Now, hopefully you know the answer to that. If you don't, you might have tuned out a little bit and you should probably rewatch this video because this is pretty important and it's important to know for the test. And so that concludes our lecture about 1.8F. In the next video, 
we'll move on to the, our next rule in the 1.8 section.